good morning, everyone. Because of COVID, one in eight Minnesotans can now attest to the fact that hunger steals your spark, stalls your contributions to the world, and erodes your health. The economic hardships of COVID-19 have left many more people hungry, creating another health crisis nested within this pandemic. The good news is that hunger is a hardship and COVID risk factor that we can control in a time when we can't control much. And as a community, we have more than enough food to go around and we are good at sharing it around the table. So let's get our arms around the problem and solutions in front of us. Today, we have a very strong expert panel um, to lead us through this conversation. And first, I am proud to present the Food Bank Perspective. <clears throat> At food banks across the country, healthy offerings increasingly bring folks our way. People struggling with food insecurity tell us they can afford um, cheap processed calories, but that it's a real struggle to find and afford fresh produce, meat, dairy, and pantry items like cooking oil. The Harvard School of Public Health recently declared the long-term health outlook for people reliant on cheap calories as grim. Specifically, consumption of those easy to find calories and afford, you know, the convenience food increases weight gain, type 2 diabetes, heart disease, and premature death. People who regularly go without enough food live with six times the diet related diseases as those who are food insecure. And that was pre COVID. The need to keep the veggies, protein, and dairy moving is a COVID response must. And we must make sure the healthy choice is a real affordable and easy choice. Hearing of folks working to turn condiments into meals, watering down milk, um, and going without so their kids can have a little more counteracts everything we're doing to come through this pandemic and thrive again as a community. Last year, 65% of the food we delivered to the community was fresh, and we are proud to stand by that commitment even during the COVID era. Our FoodRx program delivers tailored food prescriptions and education so people get fed and get well. And the price tag is closer to that of what you'll see in your local market, not your pharmacy. And I'd like to say that the side effects are, may include increased drive, improved rest, better living in a healthier community, and maybe even lower healthcare costs, which is really the silver bullet. We've brought together a, a panel um, of leading uh, local and national experts this morning to discuss the links between hunger and health and the best, best path forward during the COVID era. So first, I'm pleased to uh, welcome Dr. Mark Gorlick, President and CEO of Children's Minnesota, committed to being an essential partner in raising healthier kids for families across Minnesota. Welcome, Dr. Gorlick. Thank you. And we are thrilled to have two key national players on this call this morning. Emily Barson, Executive Director of United States of Care. Great to be with you, Emily. And Andy Slavitt, former Acting Administrator of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services and current board chair at United States of Care. Good morning, both, uh, both of you. Thanks, um, Allison. Yeah, and both Andy and Emily are working to ensure that every American has access to quality, affordable health care, regardless of health status, social need, or income. So first, we'll pass the mic to Dr. Gorlick. And Dr. Gorlick, uh, will you please share some of the innovations happening over at Children's Minnesota as you provide care to kids uh, in need during this crisis? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Allison. You know, you mentioned that Children's Minnesota, our vision is to be every family's essential partner in raising healthier children. And as one of the largest pediatric health systems in the country and the largest in the region, we, we touch a lot of lives. Our focus is in providing medical care. But we know from research that medical care only accounts for a small percentage of somebody's actually overall health. Um, most of what determines whether we're healthy is a number of other factors, social and environmental factors, one of which is nutrition or the absence of nutrition, hunger. And so we recognize at Children's Minnesota that while we are, have to provide top-notch outstanding medical care, which we do, we also need to pay attention to those other health determinants um, if we want our kids to be healthy. 
And so one of the things that we do is we incorporate that into our caregiving, both primary care and specialty care. We have a program, for example, called Community Connect. This is a program where we screen children in our clinics for a variety of potential social needs. So for example, we ask about food insecurity, um, finances, employment, childcare, legal needs, et cetera. You can see here a graphic. Um, this is an older number, but we've, we've served over 5,000 families so far that have come in and we've screened them. And you can see that food insecurity is one of the top resource needs that are identified from our families. So we ask about this, this then we do something about it. That's asking is great, but we actually need to do something. And so we have a variety of means that we do this. We can provide emergency food resources if necessary, but more importantly, we connect with community resources such as Second Harvest and other community resources that help these families get um, a source of, of food for their kids. Um, you mentioned the Food RX program. That's been a great partnership where we've been able to um, provide that and refer people. We've also been able to refer people through the partnership with Second Harvest um, families that are qualified for SNAP benefits, um, but for whatever reason have not yet um, uh, access to those. And as you can see on the bottom here, we've had a great success rate of getting people in our clinics who have a need identified that is affecting their child's health and connecting them with a resource that helps to meet that need, thereby helping ensure that that child's going to have better health outcomes. All right. Sorry about that. Couldn't get myself unmuted there. Thank you so much, Dr. Gorlick, um, for everything you and your team are doing uh, to set up these kids um, and to take care of these kids, especially during these challenging times. And now um, to our U.S. of Care team. Emily, thanks for being here. Um, what should folks know about the work you and your team are doing to improve access to quality, of, uh, quality and equitable health care? Great, thanks, Allison. I'm thrilled to be here um, and to be partnering with you and Second Harvest Heartland to lift up these critical issues at the intersection of health and hunger. Um, as you mentioned, I'm the Executive Director of United States of Care, a nonprofit organization founded in 2018 by a diverse group of advocates, providers, regular people, entrepreneurs, health policy and public health experts, community leaders, and more. Our mission, as you shared, is to ensure that every single American has access to quality, affordable health care, regardless of health status, social need, or income. Our country is at a pivotal moment, and that mission has never been more relevant or more important than right now. The COVID pandemic and the National Movement for Racial Justice have shown a light on longstanding gaps and critical inequities in our health care system, including the social determinants of health, those factors outside of direct health care that impact how healthy we are. Since the pandemic began, we at US of Care have fully shifted our resources to support COVID-19 response efforts. We've coalesced our expertise, content, network, and listening research to develop and release a number of valuable resources and recommendations to healthcare leaders, as well as providing one-on-one -on -one technical and expert assistance to federal and state policymakers. Our resources and materials can be found at our COVID hub at unitedstatesofcare.org. As the public health crisis collides with the economic challenges being felt across the country, states are taking action to address hunger and other social determinants of health in a number of ways. Uh, so to provide some perspective, I'll share a few examples. Like Minnesota, uh, many states have invested federal CARES Act funding into existing food banks and distribution centers in their states. North Carolina and Florida work to ensure families whose children normally have access to free and reduced lunches at school were able to receive additional food benefits through the new pandemic electronic benefit transfer program. Virginia and New Jersey enrolled in a new pilot program to allow SNAP recipients to purchase groceries online, helping families who live in a food desert and also preventing families from needing to go to a physical grocery store and further risking spread of COVID. Tennessee Governor Bill Lee announced the creation of the Tennessee Talent Exchange a public-private partnership to match out-of-work Tennesseans with companies currently experiencing business surges. And in Virginia, uh, the governor has increased access to health care for Medicaid members and low-income residents, including waiving co-pays and expanded access to telehealth, 
and modifying Virginia's child care subsidy program to expand eligibility and ensure continued support for essential personnel. We know these efforts are critical and with states also funding, facing funding challenges, we've called on Congress to provide additional resources for state and local governments to help their communities in their responses. As Allison shared, the statistics are staggering and we're so grateful to work in partnership with organizations like Second Harvest Heartland who are doing the work on the ground in communities to address hunger. At USF Care, we're focused on the dual challenge of meeting the immediate needs of the overlapping crises in the country right now and working to come out stronger on the other side with a more equitable healthcare system moving forward. One that actually works to keep people healthy and which, where everyone in the country can access the care that meets their needs. We know this is gonna take time and uh, we need to keep our focus on the people and communities impacted by the system in order to succeed. Um, with that, I'm delighted to have with us our board chair, um, US of Care founder and board chair, Andy Slavitt, who's gonna share some of his perspectives as well. Andy. Thank you. And thank you so much to Second Heartland uh, for hosting this and for the work you've been doing over these last few months. Uh, it's so inspiring. And uh, Dr. Gorlick, um, thank you for what you and your team do every day and uh, on the front line, uh, the risk that I know the caregivers feel every day is they take care of people and heal us. Um, look, I, I'm gonna, I wanna start by making the case that food is important to your life, but I don't really have to because you know that. And just like it's important in your life and your health, it's important to everybody's. I don't think there's an argument to be made that when we fail people on getting people the nutrition that people need, the healthy calories that people need, as Allison said, we fail them on almost every level. And it's the most basic failure that there is. Um, I've, not, I've never had the experience of going to bed, not worrying about my next day's meal. I am so privileged. I am so privileged. Uh, and I didn't realize that privilege growing up. Um, and I know that's not the case for all of you listening in. I know that many of you have had that feeling, that experience, that insecurity. and I've learned how impossible it is to do anything else, to concentrate, to be good at school, to stay healthy, to worry about other people, to not have a short temper. I don't know how it happens. And if you're like me and you've never had that experience, then I'm sure you're also like me and wanting to commit to make sure that we end that. It doesn't have to happen. Um, so coming into this crisis, we have an administration that has been um, cutting SNAP benefits and cutting Medicaid. So let's think about that. Actually, again, let's not think about that. There's no reason to think about that. Do we want to think about whether or not there are people that deserve to eat and people who don't? Let's not think, let's feed. Let's just feed. Let's just feed people. Let's just feed people. And, you know, I've been over and seen what they do at Second Heartland, and I can tell you there's no better feeling. There's no better feeling than being able to help somebody so directly. There's no more important feeling. So, do we have enough food in this country? Absolutely. Do we have enough resources in this country? Absolutely. Do we have enough awareness? No. We need more, that's what we're doing here today, that's what your job is. Do we have enough amazing people? Well, the people who work at Second, uh, this, at, uh, Second Harvest Heartland, um, these are people that I know could be working in any field they wanted, and they know that this is the most inspiring vision. So however you come to it, come to it. I've spent the last couple of months talking with people like uh, Chef Jose Andres, who's been feeding a couple hundred thousand people a day, um, watching what uh, Allison and the team here at Second Harvest have been doing, um, looking at what's happening with food lines around the country. I get, um, I get a report um, on this um, from uh, several people in Washington. And I can tell you, it's getting worse, it's getting desperate, and the kinds of calories people do get in these moments are exactly the kinds of calories that Allison suggested. They're the kind of calories that fix them on the spot, but give them just salty snacks, sugary foods, and quite frankly, our are all profits to large corporations like PepsiCo and Coca-Cola, who I have nothing against, um, but that's not the kind of food we can be giving people, and that's what Second Harvest does. So I just wanna close by saying we can do this. 
we have to do this. This is our moment. This is the moment that our country um, has called on us for, and we're more than capable uh, through the leadership of Second Harvest. Thank you, Andy. I agree we can do this, and I just appreciate everyone um, joining us this morning. So I'm sure we have loads of questions in the queue. Elizabeth, do you want to lead us through those? Absolutely. So first, we've heard from Rachel in Minneapolis. She says she's worried about kids in my community who may have a harder time getting school meals this year if we do move to distance learning, which we know we are in many, many communities. What does this mean for their development? How can we help them? So I think, Allison, if you would like to kick us off, and then maybe we'll hear from Dr. Gorlick as well on this one. Yeah, I'm happy to and happy to kick it to anyone else who um, has something to say. Well, thank you, Rachel, for um, your question. And you're right. I think we all share the belief that when kids don't have the proper nutrition, they face serious health consequences down the road. Um, and so our child hunger team is working around the clock to work with school districts about what we're going to do this fall. More to come on that. Um, these announcements are being made right now, but our team is, is literally working around the clock to make sure we have um, the operations set up so kids can get the meals they need, um, no matter what school looks like. But <clears throat> I think, so I want to talk about the SNAP program for a minute here. SNAP is the closest thing to a silver bullet to ending hunger that we have right now. And so as we look, as we've been working over the summer and as we turn to the fall, whatever we can do to sign up eligible families for SNAP is just so critical right now. It has shown, um, it has so many benefits. It not only helps people meet their monthly budget, helps, you know, provides long-term um, health benefits and leads to uh, success, long-term success for folks. It also fuels the economy. And so when I think about SNAP, we need to connect every Minnesotan who is eligible to that program right now. We are working like crazy to do that, but we also need support at the federal level to boost and strengthen that program so people have it, especially at a time like this when they need it most. Dr. Gorlick um, or Andy or Emily, anything you all wanna say about that? I, I would um, echo the importance of food uh, and nutrition in a child's development, including their physical development and their mental and social development. So, you know, success at school um, is based on a foundation of the child being well nourished. Um, and you can't concentrate if you're hungry. Um, so, school meals have been a very important component of that. Um, recognizing that that is for many kids their only opportunity to get a, a really nutritious meal is the meals at school. With schools closed, many districts are making efforts to make sure kids still get that, but there are still barriers, right? If families have to go pick up the meals at school instead of the child going to school, not every family has those resources. So um, certainly efforts by the schools to continue those programs are great. As Allison said, um, if the kids uh, are able to access benefits like SNAP that allow them to also get proper nutrition at home. That's another factor. Um, but to the point of the question, um, there are so many effects of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, particularly on kids. But one of the big ones is um, the disruption in all of our normal safety net things that we have, um, one of which is the school meal program, which has been so successful in addressing child nutrition, and it is something that is at risk and we have to pay attention to. All right, thanks so much for that. Next up, we have Alex in Burnsville who writes, I'd like to ask Mr. Slavitt what we can do about masking. I returned to my hometown this week and was confronted aggressively about my choice to wear a mask. He asks, Andy, what would you say in the moment to that treatment and what would you say to our community about masks? So uh, this is an important question. I think uh, there is good evidence in, in real studies which show that if most of us wear masks, um, we actually suffocate the virus. It has no place to go because of, for the virus to be alive, it has to pass, and it's not actually technically alive, but for it to survive, it has to pass between people who are breathing it. And so when it has no place to go, it starts to stagnate. So you can really reduce the spread. 
And so it is important um, and, and beneficial to you, and it's certainly beneficial to your neighbors. Look, um, I, I, will t I will tell you that, you know, I did an episode on our podcast in the bubble about this. How do you talk to people who disagree with you about masks and social distancing? And the truth is, um, you, you know, you're not going to be able to persuade somebody in the moment and, and don't make that your goal. What you can do, and, and I think underlying people's general reason for not wearing a mask is this, uh, the number one reason they say is that they don't like to be told what to do. So getting into an argument with them is not going to work. And I have to say that it doesn't feel tempting. Um, but a lot, but interestingly enough, a lot of what's effective is getting people to think about why you're wearing a mask and um, to remind them that they have agency. Um, because in some sense, I guess, I know I choose to, and here is why I do, because of my mother, grandmother, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and to um, even uh, ask them, you know, curious of your thoughts, why, without confronting them, if you do get into a conversation, you know, what, what they're thinking is and why they make the choice that they have made. But I think getting into a society where half the people are, are, or more are wearing masks and glaring at the other half part and the other part's glaring at the other part, that's not gonna do us any good. Uh, we, you know, we do need to pull together. We shouldn't make this a dividing line. And I, I would encourage people to look at other people's choices while we don't agree with them. And I think they're not good for public health as choices that they have every right to make, even if they're uh, technically violating an ordinance. And that, um, we deal with them on the level of, oh, that's a judgment you've made. This is the judgment that I've made. We can't control the people or the things that are out of our control. It'll just make you frustrated. So if you're going to places that are continually unsafe, uh, don't do them, uh, go to other places. And um, you know, each of us can try to change things little by little, but it's gonna be, this kind of cultural shift doesn't happen overnight. And the good news is, all the polling shows the vast majority of people do agree with masking. There is a vocal minority and it's not, it's a, it's a sizable minority, but who, who doesn't? And, you know, they're going to get there um, when they get there and some of them will never get there. And, you know, that's just, um, it's just a, a um, but don't make it your task to convert them um, uh, unless you want to try to help them under, understand where you're coming from. Thanks My so much. Advice. That's fantastic. All right, so here's uh, one from Ellery, who's posting with the help of her mom. She's eight, and she is tuning in this morning because she plans to be a pediatrician, she says. Uh, she'd like a little more help understanding the social determinants of health. What does that mean? So maybe Dr. Gorlick and Andy, you can tag team that one. Sure, so first of all, good job, Ellery. I totally encourage you in your career path. I am a pediatrician myself, it's awesome. Um, so as I mentioned, you know, what determines whether we're healthy or not is a combination of a lot of factors. Some of it is medical care we get, going in, getting your shots, getting treated when you're sick. And that's about 20% of our health is from health care. The other 80% is all the stuff around us. Everything from the environment, the air we breathe, the water we drink, um, the foods we eat or don't have access to, our housing, um, the choices that we make. So all of those collectively, that other 80% of all those external factors outside of that medical system, that's what we call the social determinants of health. There are things in society that determine whether or not we are born and grow up and live healthy lives. Fantastic. Yeah, look, I think you can explain it to us, Ellery, um, uh, and, and probably better than we can explain it to you. Because I think you would say, what are the things that make you feel healthy? What are the things that make you uh, feel safe? What are the things that make you feel good about yourself? Um, uh, it's, it's when you are with family. It's when you have a, uh, you're sleeping in a, in, a, at night and you've got loved ones around you that are tucking you in. It's when um, you're, you're, um, you have sadnesses, but the sadnesses um, have people around you to help you and to talk to. Um, and you don't worry about things. You just can be a kid. And that's what we want. And, and, and that's what we want into adulthood. We want people to not have to worry about all of the other things like where, like is they living in a safe place? Can they get where they want to go? Can they put a, a meal on the table? They have enough to eat. Are they safe? Are they, are they living with someone who is going to take care of them or someone who's not as nice? Those things, those things right there, they make up your health as, as um, you just heard from Dr. Gorlick. Those are the things that will also make you healthier. And uh, those are the things that uh, people should have in their lives. And so 
the reason you're becoming a pediatrician, I think, is because you understand those things already at your age. So I predict you're going to change the world. That's great. We're rooting for you, Ellery. Thanks so much for the great question. Um, now we're hearing from Mika Setterstrom. She wonders, how can we be more intentional with addressing the impact of racism on food insecurity? What are some strategies that you recommend? I know that the whole panel um, will have thoughts to offer. Allison, will you start us off? I'm happy to. Thank you, Elizabeth, and thank you, Mika. Um, super great question, and I think this is part of how we um, fix systemic racism is by talking about it. And so you are on the absolute right track and we are trying to do our best to learn and listen and um, make sure we are elevating voices in this conversation to continue the conversation. So um, there's a lot more I could say, but maybe I'll give everyone else a chance to chime in too. But thank you, Mika. Dr. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Um, look, I think um, the, the, the point we have to start with is um, understanding how and where people live. And, um, you know, the, the fact that, um, you know, if you ask yourself, if you look around your neighborhood, how many places can I buy fresh, healthy foods? Um, you know, do, is, do I have a Whole Foods? Do I have um, a, a farmer's market that comes uh, near, that I have access to, either I can drive to or I can walk to? Um, uh, and and um, all of the questions, or, or, or I have other cho choices. And I think, um, you know, people have done a lot of work to look at where fresh food is located and where there's lack of fresh food and what they find, and they describe these as, as, um, as food deserts is you know food from a gas station um oftentimes is the best people can do um so um a, a 99 cent bag of chips is the closest source of calories to you and there's no source of fresh food um that is part of the structural racism that is part of the problem um and so what, what can we do about it well we fr local markets fresh local markets in communities are very, very important. Um, you know, we should have um, uh, gardens that people um, in all kinds of communities and urban communities uh, can have. And we should make access to food, um, not something that is special. I mean, if we have to think about this question, we're already privileged. Uh, but for, for many people who are, I'm sure many on this call either grew up that way or still live in areas and communities where that's not happening, that's not okay. That's not okay, that's not acceptable any longer. And I think what Allison said is very important. You can talk about that now. You can talk about that as part of the racism in this country. And I think it's one of the freedoms that you have today that we didn't have um, uh, a while, a little while ago when you couldn't talk in those kinds of terms. But the only way it gets fixed is if you can call it by its name and then start to fix it. And I'm so grateful for the places in Minneapolis, the YWCA is one I know for sure that has been, uh, and, and, and other places have been working to make that, uh, to right that wrong. And the only thing I would add is just um, the recognition is important. And we, we've talked about, for example, um, the, how COVID-19 pandemic has worsened issues around nutrition and food access. And, you know, these are all linked together because the, the disproportionate impact has been on communities of color. Um, and that is partly because of um, underlying uh, health issues that have plagued um, uh, people of color because of the structural racism in our system. So, you know, obesity is a form of malnutrition and uh, it has to do with, you know, it's not just the amount of food, but the type of food. And that in turn is a result of all kinds of, you know, practices and laws uh, that have come down over the years around where food uh, is located, how people access food, how people pay for food. So um, to the point everybody's making, calling that out as a form of structural racism and recognizing its roots are going to be key to actually trying to develop both practical and policy solutions that are gonna help us address that. 
I wonder, Elizabeth, if I should chime in on other things. You know, I'm, we're all making the point about um, calling it uh, as it is and listening and learning and having a conversation. I will assure you, Mika, that Second Harvest Heartland is at the table for that conversation. And I think all the people on this call are. Um, but Second Harvest Heartland also has a role to play just operationally when we saw, um, you know, in the aftermath of George Floyd's killing and the acute needs in those communities along the Lake Street Corridor in Midway in North Minneapolis. We are, you know, again, working around the clock with those communities to make sure we have infused healthy food where people have lost access. And we continue to do that. We are doing... Um, holding three mass distributions um, along the Lake Street Corridor every week, serving you know, between 800 and 1,200 families at a time. We will continue that as long as that is needed. Um, and we are supporting, you know, we are doing that in response to requests from our, our community organizations that we partner with and making sure we're, we're offering um, what the community needs. So taking the lead of the community and making sure we keep listening to what the needs are, um, right? Uh, you know, right after Memorial Day, there was a really urgent need for formula and diapers and other hygiene products. We, this operational team here at Second Harvest Heartland, I could brag about them and be proud about them forever. But we worked that weekend to get things um, right into those communities, so people had baby formula to last the week or the weekend. So there is a whole bunch of other work that we do, and I know everyone on this call is doing to help um, address urgent current needs, but we're also all at the table for the longer, um, the longer haul, because this is not going to be, we can't fix structural racism overnight. So we're with you. Absolutely. I'd like to add on to that, if I could. I think it is really important for, for any of us who want to try to address this to listen to the communities involved about what the problems are. We also need to listen to them about what the solutions are. Um, and that has historically been a bit of a disconnect. So I think we've gotten better about trying to authentically listen to what, what needs to be addressed. But honestly, we need to do a much better job of, um, because you know, all of us are from organizations that are largely white. Um, we need to be much more authentically partnering with um, people who are affected to find out what, not only what do they need, but how to fix it. Thanks, Dr. Gorlick, and thanks, panel. So a related question has come in from Kathleen in Taylor's Ball. She writes, uh, she calls this out for Andy. What can every American do to make healthcare more available to more folks? I can't spare a lot of money, she says. I can vote and I have a phone I can light up about this issue. So Andy and others, what do you wanna to say to Kathleen? Well, look, look um, uh, I don't wanna make the primary message about politics and political involvement. You know, this is a nonprofit, non, you know, we're, not, we're all nonpartisan, but you raise such an important point about, about being involved. Um, and, you know, the, the good news is that if we ask Americans, do they believe that people should be able, should have to worry about being able to take care of their families if someone gets sick, or should that be off the table? The majority of people, the vast majority of people of all parties agree. If you ask people similarly, should people have to worry about food? And uh, the vast majority of people don't think they should. Um, so this isn't a big political divide. Um, our country is more is unified, uh, but sometimes. Um, our political system doesn't represent where the American public is. Sometimes that happens because we have uh, people who don't vote. We have people. We have districts that are drawn funny. We have um, strange things like Citizens United, which make certain voices much more powerful than other voices. The only way that that gets combated is if people like you are listened to and make yourselves heard and make a bit of a racket, make a bit of a fuss, and make it make it on behalf of the people of the families that are standing in line to get food from um, Second Harvest because they're so busy taking care of their families. They're so busy just getting that food that they don't have the effort or energy to raise their political voices like some of us who have the luxury do. And you're right, it doesn't cost any money, but let people hear from us. And I tell you, every congressperson every day gets a report on who they've heard from and what on what topics and what they're for or against. 
So light it up. If that's if you're so inclined, light it up. Thanks so much, Andy. Fantastic. All right, we have time for one more question, and this has come in from Jeremiah in St. Anthony. He's asking Dr. Gorlick, how can we make food a part of well child exams? I think parents should leave their well child exams with some education about food and help they can get and foods their kids need to grow well, almost like a prescription. Well, it's a great point. And in fact, nutritional counseling is a routine part of well child care. So our our primary care pediatricians follow guidelines from the American Academy of Pediatrics, and they've developed a whole um, set of um, materials to help primary care providers counsel families on a variety of topics, one of which is nutrition and the importance of both, again, as I mentioned earlier, the amount and the type of food. And, and that is tailored to the child's age. So newborns, it's largely about breastfeeding and the importance and value of breastfeeding and, um, uh, and then introducing foods. And then as kids get older, issues related to um, uh, helping them develop healthy eating habits, helping them to develop a healthy relationship with eating because another form of uh, food problems we see is in teenagers with various eating disorders. So it is an important part of nutritional counseling um, and increasingly um, an important part, as I mentioned, our Community Connect program is not just helping families understand the importance of nutrition, but finding out about their access to resources and then connecting them when it's appropriate. So the WIC program, Women, Infants, and Children program that can provide uh, nutrition for pregnant moms and babies, um, the SNAP program that we've talked about. So I think um, uh, pediatricians inherently understand the importance of food and nutrition uh, for child development and health. Um, and we do build it into that, um, to that counseling. Um, and I would say if you have an experience where you're not getting that, you should raise the question because this is what we're trained to do is to, is to help people raise healthier kids. Great. Good question and good idea, Jeremiah. All right, so the minutes have flown by. It's been such a wonderful conversation. We are a bit over time. So thank you all for the extra minutes. Final thoughts, panelists, before, uh, before we end today's conversation. Dr. Gorlick, maybe, oh, Andy, go ahead. Someone should go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll start. I wanna thank Second Heartland for sponsoring this. I think this issue of nutrition is incredibly important, especially at a time now when, when um, we're finding increasing challenges for families in accessing food. Um, it's affecting the, their health, it's affecting your kids' health. So raising awareness is, of this issue is critical. Thank you. Thank you for the work you're doing to help um, uh, both all the people you serve and organizations like ours working together to try to help these families. Um, it's been, there's a great partnership there. So appreciate that. And I, I agree, just wanna echo that thanks. I think this this moment when everything is, this crisis has really amplified all these needs and the intersection of all the needs of, of health and hunger and, uh, and racism and other social determinants of health that you know, uh, are really just underscoring existing problems in the system. And you know, I'm so grateful to Allison's leadership and the team at, at Second Harvest Heartland for the work that you're doing on the ground. And you know, our hope is that we can be part of the solution of, of coming out stronger on the other end. So if, if I were a religious person, I would say that we are being given a test right now. We're being given a test to see um, uh, how, how we respond to people in such significant need um, from a health standpoint, from a hunger standpoint, from an economic standpoint, um, from a, a, a racial justice standpoint, a, a, as Emily so uh, articulately said. Um, and I think, I imagine we're going to look back on this time later and ask ourselves how we responded. I think our kids are going to ask us, I think our grandkids are going to ask us, um, you know, what did we do? You know, not were we scared, I, everybody's scared, um, but we're going to be fine, we're going to come through this. The question is, there are a lot more people who don't have the luxury of worrying about that right now, and there's just never been a greater opportunity to help people. I mean, the most exciting thing if you want to look at it in a positive way about being alive right now is there's never been a greater chance to make people's lives better. There's never been a greater chance 
to help people feel good. There's never been a better chance to support people. There's never been a better chance to save people's lives than we have right now. And, and you know, to me, it's incredibly energizing. And every day I, I look at people like Allison O'Toole and all the people on her team that are too num numerous to mention. And they just get up and do that every day. And I want to think, I, all I think is how can I support people like that? And if, if you're so inclined, I know there are, are links uh, both on the United States of Care website and Twitter page. And there's uh, obviously places on the se Second Harvest Heartland page. Um, there's so many ways. Um, but I, I intend to try to look back on this period of time and um, I will remember the people who are doing the work um, that Second Har Harvest Heartland is doing. And it's going to be one of the things we're, we're most proud of. Yeah, thank you. I don't have much more to say, but I agree, Andy, we are being tested. I am so proud of this team. I'm proud of this community. Um, we can't do this alone. And so what gives me hope is every week when we have conversations like this, when partners come together to try and fix this and make this community better. So thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us this morning. Thanks to all the people tuning in who are interested in, in furthering this conversation. And we will see you all next week.